strategic management level in all sectors of the economy from air transportation to sea transportation including financial manufacturing hospitality and service sectors he has proven successful experience in hr strategic formulation and implementation and successful researches he has carried out in work design productivity performance management and diversity management he shares experiences internationally he is a chartered fellow in strategic hr management from the Institute Chartered Institute of Personal and Development, and he has an MBA from University of Surrey. Mr. Salaru, please greet the participants. Thank you very much, and good evening to all participants and everyone around the world watching this webinar. In fact, it's a great pleasure. We are honored. We have members of the World Federation present, and I, at least I think four members of the World Federation present today. And uh, this is the type of support that the World Federation is looking forward to give to all national associations. Uh, we have been doing the same thing uh, in Africa. I think you are aware that I'm the president of the African Human, Con Human Resource Confederation. And we have been doing at least three webinars and where we have had the pleasure of having Leila Nascimento, the actual president, and Bob Morton, the Secretary General. And, uh, it's really a great pleasure trying to share ideas, views, challenges that HR managers are facing in these difficult times. So thank you. Looking forward to a positive participation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salaru. So it's a great honor to, again, introduce you. He doesn't need any introduction. Our uh, revered Dr. Eke Balian. A widely acknowledged business leader and HR professional across the globe, Dr. Balian is an MPEC from IIT Delhi and PhD from Germany and has worked with Reliance Infrastructure Limited, group company of Reliance Ada Group as CEO, oil and gas vertical. He was also MD and CEO in Petronet LNG Limited, New Delhi, and also worked in Oil and Natural Gas Corporation, ONGC, from 1976 to 2010, various positions and in director. HR and Business Development of ONGC. He is fellow of AIMA, past president of Delhi Management Association and past national president of NIPM. And now the floor is over to Balian Sao, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sao. Uh, a very warm welcome to, first of all, to my all fellow panelists and all the participants. It's a great opportunity for me to really moderate this wonderful webinar. Uh, first of all, I like to NIPM, the president of the NIPM, Secretary General, and all the office bearers thought to organize this webinar on a, such a uh, important uh, topic. Friends, um, I, I propose to make some opening remarks and then I'd request to uh, speak by rotation, uh, giving some brief about uh, how the businesses, companies, uh, have done now country, what their organizations have done, and they can briefly tell about the all that they have worked. And perhaps then after that, uh, a round of uh, I questions, uh, I think I would make it relevant for all the participants. Uh, the, uh, this webinar, we are conscious that we should keep uh, time for the question answer. So I think all the participants would have an opportunity to raise uh, their issues, their questions, and we'd like to accommodate as much as possible. So uh, first of all, uh, just a few opening remarks for me. Um, well, friends, you are kind of impact the world and also our country, India, is the impact of this COVID-19 pandemic. It's a great, great in the overall functioning of the countries, of the business organizations, impacted very badly uh, all sectors of the, of the uh, businesses. How long to continue? How long and what kind of impact really and uh, have on, on a long term basis is is spent and assumption. We are not really sure because so far we don't have any medicine, and as such, it is very difficult to really 
um, assess how long it's impact to perhaps think about whether it's going to be for six months, 10 months, a year, perhaps live with some kind of precautions along with this kind of a pandemic. How prepared as individual? How are we prepared as a team, as a company, perhaps an industry to, to deal with this kind of uncertainty? I think essential services sectors in all the participating, uh, you know, our in their countries, I think most of the uh, businesses perhaps came to more halt. And I can only say that uh, I come from an oil and gas sector and in I have never seen such kind of impact where the crude oil was being sold at the name. That means the terms of contracts were so that the crude oil of had the provision of lifting it and also get some more money from the producers. This is unprecedented and kind of a, a dip in the prices, uncertainty, volatility. I, I've never seen in my lifetime at least on that. So if you see first, just a small figure from uh, India, um, we have that indicator, which is uh, an indicator of uh, basically how sound is the manufacturing in country. In the month of February, the PMI index was about uh, 55. It fell in March to around 51. In April, it came. Bad. So I think, and, and anything below 50 means that the industry manufacturing capability could be contracting. So I think we are short of uh, uh, all there is too much. How the company should come up, how they should revive, what kind of revival that we are expecting? Um, is it going to be a V-shaped or it is going to be a U-shaped recovery? Some experts are talking about it the type of uh, recovery. Some even saying that we do not know in the uncertainty it could be an L uh, recovery to be a very long term kind of a thing. So I think this unprecedented calls for industry also to take unprecedented type of actions. So we are going to discuss today how these companies have tried challenges and particularly focusing on what are the HR. They take it that under the situation of a crisis situation for industry, I firmly believe that HR can take up in heat. They can come up with good initiatives. And therefore, we like to really uh, some of the thoughts that uh, from India and at the same time, look at what the countries have done. We have some of the very experienced people who have uh, led the actors, who have also driven the HR function. So I think uh, I'm to straight away and request, first of all, uh, Mr. Bob Morton, to share maybe in five, seven minutes time, your general uh, thought process on the environment is today keeping that uh, uh, Britain has been for long most industrialized, industrialized uh, uh, country and, 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 and uh, with more uh, HR processes and systems, we like to really look forward to your uh, specifics on, on, but first of all, maybe uh, your views on the, on the present. Right, Bob Martin. Right. Thank you, Ashok. Um, uh, it's a Pleasure to um, well, pleasure is maybe the wrong word given the circumstances, but it's it's I'm, I'm very happy to be able to contribute to the, the webinar. Um, I think just briefly, um, the thing I'd like to emphasise, uh, which is to pick on on something you've said, or pick up on something you've said, is that context here is key. Um, you know what's happening in some countries is not going to work in other countries at all because our business environments are very, very different. And one of the things just in a general sense is that what this um, hugely disruptive pandemic has demonstrated is how fragile 
many of our industries are. Um, it seems to me a lot of industries have forgotten the basic concepts of business in terms of net cash flow, etc. They're running on extremely small reserves, and this has been massively exposed during this particular um, uh, period. With regards to the UK, um, you know, quite frankly, I think we've made a bit of a mess of things. Um, we've been a bit too slow. Um, we, we've been reactive rather than proactive in some areas. And um, there's every possibility at the moment we could have a second spike of, of the virus in some parts of the country. Um, uh, and it just shows you how difficult it is to control people's behavior <laughs> as we're all individuals and so on with the lockdown. But in terms of um, uh, recession, um, our view is, is perhaps rather pessimistic at the moment, which is that there may well be a short-term bounce back in some industries. And bear in mind, by the way, some industries, uh, for them, this is a silver lining. Not every industry has actually um, gone down in this environment. You know, if you've got shares in pharmaceutical companies, then you're sitting pretty well, you know, pretty well indeed. Um, or hygiene companies, or retail, in fact, in, in, in the food industry. So some industries are actually benefiting um, uh, from this, but the majority have been hit very hard. And our view is the recession, uh, certainly in Europe, <clears throat> in the UK, will take two to three years to pick up. Um, and it will be a U shape, I think, rather than a, a, a deep V. Um, globally, it remains to be seen. Um, you know, I, I still think there's going to be a global recession because we're not quite clear yet. I don't think anybody's clear what's happening in the USA. Um, including their president. Um, and so I think that um, there's going to be a, a global recession. We have to be uh, cognizant of that fact and, and uh, you know, factor that into our crisis planning, if you like. Um, I think from an HR perspective, just anything that you want to add? Hello? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, from an HR perspective, just to sort of focus. You want to We'll, we'll move on to our uh, next panel. Uh, okay, okay. Okay. Fernando. Yeah, I'll come back to um, uh, the HR perspective in a moment then. Yeah, go on. I thought, uh, sorry, uh, Bob's presentation was not over or what happened? I don't know. Okay. And anyway, uh, see, um, the topic of today's uh, your webinar is about the HR as business partner during economic uh, slowdown. I, in fact, uh, always uh, advocate uh, HR is not just a business partner, but HR is uh, going to be uh, the center stage and HR will be the leader in the post-pandemic uh, uh, era, uh, maybe in the short term or the long medium term, because uh, we'll have to take uh, take the forefront uh, in in uh, uh, tackling this situation. And globally, the governments are scrambling to prevent jobs, and I think such endeavors are very crucial for the time being. Since if not, there can be widespread unemployment and job losses. It is not different different in, in Sri Lanka either. That I will come back when on the second round during what are the specific measures that the particular particularly the government and the businesses are taking in preventing such job losses. And, uh, <clears throat> but the scales that we are talking about are pretty daunting. Therefore, now is the time the governments and the private sectors must take some tangible action in addressing short-term challenges, as well as future-proofing the people capital. Because the impact of the crisis is going beyond the, the economic impact, and it's uh, seemingly the digital disruption, which we've been talking about, uh, we've, been, we've been in the uh, industry 4.0, and uh, we've been talking about digital transformations and all that, but uh, this thing accelerated the digital disruption by challenging the labor market fundamentals. So it prompts us to ask questions about the future of work and how it changes the people's mindset and what it does to the organizational design, etc. While, while the governments around the world are trying to steer their respective countries out of the health crisis, 
the leaders also must think of and designing measures for rapid and sustainable rebound of their national economies, as well as also using the crisis to reimagine the future of work, which should necessarily be with the people first approach, according to my, my measure. And uh, firstly, one of the critical areas in doing so is addressing the skill mismatch. And even before the pandemic, as part of the, as I said earlier, the digital disruption, this has been a huge challenge. And this is easier said than done. If we do not understand the real device strategies, which can meet the labor force challenges, it will help growth and improve productivity. Further, responding to the labor market shocks, of course, the sheer numbers make us real with shock and all. It is estimated that about 1.9 billion people, that is just about half of the world's working population will be affected in some way or the other by the changes caused by the COVID. Well, one in, that means one in six people are likely to lose their jobs during the next three months. So the near term unemployment rate can be around 17% according to ILO. And the labor income loss will be 3.4 trillion. Uh, the travel, the leisure, catering, construction, non-food retail and manufacturing plus accommodation sectors will be the worst hit uh, in this uh, scenario. And, but the governments are also taking some swift measures to prevent loss of income in the form of loans, tax relief, short-term uh, <coughs> redeployment, and one-off payment and temporary uh, uh, co compensation schemes, uh, so on and so forth, and helping organizations to cover up uh, their payroll costs. There will be rebalance of unemployment. I feel that towards the end of this year, or probably the early part of uh, 2021. But there will be long-lasting structural changes, which were brought about by the pandemic, such as uh, accelerated automation, as we all can imagine, and also the remote and flexible work arrangements, etc., which will affect uh, many jobs during the uh, next decade. And uh, how do we take on the new work measures and the fabric of work? For example, around 30% of jobs are expected to require totally a new sets of skills. In fact, uh, the pandemic has transformed uh, our working modes. I will say that a major part of the working population has engaged in the work from, from home experiment during the pandemic. Already, most of the organizations are making their long-term plans for a hybrid mode of work uh, in the future. That means part remote work and part uh, on-site work based upon uh, the flexible arrangements. And this requires digital skills. And in certain countries, I know for sure in UK, the remuneration rates are higher for those who already have digital skills. And therefore, acquisition of new digital skills is a sin quantum for the future post-COVID era. These are the things that HR can, you know, either, I don't know whether business partnering or leadership uh, things that we can do further. The freelance work will be increased and also the transformation also will shift focus from process and procedures to results. That means achievement of bottom lines. Therefore, the strategies required to facilitate these initiatives uh, need to be <laughs> and implemented by the organizations on near term, medium term and long term and implemented with equal urgency. And with this first three to six months, within this first three to six months, uh, to, to strategy, strategize for how to retain people. And from there, from, from now to medium term, probably one year, we should adopt a redeployment strategies to minimize the job losses. Finally, at the same time, we need to implement reskilling people as overall post-COVID imperative, which will be overarching, having an overarching effect, uh, effect uh, on people. So uh, uh, that means uh, uh, strategies on people to redeployment and uh, then uh, reskilling uh, are the, the, uh, some of the things which are very important. Uh, the first, I mean, uh, when you talk about the uh, short term, medium term and long term strategies and addressing the issues of uh, skill matching, skill mismatch. The skill mismatch was a problem for governments even before the COVID, but, uh, which prevented millions of people fulfilling their potential. 
created se uh, several uh, severe labor productivity losses. And of course, the BCG analysis, analysis shows that the mismatch effectively imposed 6% of annual tax on the global economy. And that now, as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, the situation could cost about 11% in terms of productivity or 18 trillion in unrealized GDP uh, by 2025. <clears throat> so this means retaining, redeployment, and reskilling are some of the important things. So thank you very much once again. Uh, let you. us move on to the second round and discuss. Uh, sure, sure. Thank you, Mr. Fernando. I think very important points you raised that uh, there is definitely you are looking at that there are some structural changes happening, and therefore the overall realignment of the business, HR processes, systems. In fact, the way work is going to be done, the future of work would be perhaps different. Uh, take it point, I think important points to be discussed. Uh, I'm sorry, Bob, uh, we had to, um, somehow we could listen to you, couldn't, couldn't uh, there was a connection problem. Uh, any other point that you wanted to share, Bob? I, just, I, I completely agree with um, uh, Danica that um, uh, these, these are the areas that we, um, uh, as HR, I think the, the thing to remember as well is that HR itself, um, it, we're certainly focusing on our businesses and our, our workforce and so on, um, but there's a requirement for, for HR professionals um, to upskill in terms of the level of their agility their ability to sort of formulate new ways of thinking about practices and policies in their organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and especially if you think a lot of organizations around the world are still built on a control and command system. Mm -hmm. um, what is happening, I think, socially, uh, certainly the UK, the US, and in parts of Europe, I'm not sure about India, and uh, certainly in parts of Asia, it is, is that um, people are going to demand more they want more equality what this pandemic has demonstrated is that there are huge sections of the workforce which are underpaid and underutilized uh, and not regarded very well either um, and this is going to take some thinking on hr's part to how what do we do about establishing good equality in organizations um, not least for example in the uk uh, both the gender pay gap and the fact that care workers who are the most important in the current situation are the most poorly paid. So there's going to be some real challenges for HR to rethink Reading. how it looks at the world. And we need to upskill ourselves. We mustn't forget that we are not the cobbler's children, as you say. Right. You. Very well said. I think very, very, very correctly on this. Well, I fully agree on that. But this has really made, the COVID has made it realize it um, and perhaps brought certain things into focus that we should be doing. Thank you very much for your uh, additional remarks. I'll now move on to and request our national president, NIPM um, India, Sri Kulkarni, for his uh, opening remarks. Mr. Kulkarni, please. Thank you so much, sir. Once again, good afternoon to all. Before going to the topic, I always remember a quote from Dr. T. V. Rao, who's the father of HRD in India, who always said, that HR is not a business partner, but, but HR itself is a business. And I agree with that. The biggest challenge for organization and specifically human resource professionals in economic slowdown is to survive and remain competitive. Organizations are restructuring. Investment in human capital will be no more a high priority for any organization since their survival is threatened by economic slowdown. Every slowdown, as it unfolds, creates challenges for HR professionals to take fresh look on their traditional model, which focuses on administrative functions, compensations, benchmarking, employee welfare, employee grievances, performance review, HR policies, etc. Post slowdown period is time to step back, understand actual need of employee and organization create a balance, modify and innovate HR policies according to the need of the organization and market condition. Organization expects from human resource professional to bring new ideas to change HRM processes 
and to develop or change policies and all these efforts must be at the lower cost human resource innovations are easy in times of business growth but are very challenging during slow down human resource professionals have to take many unpopular decisions during this slow down period to save the money of the organization such as to minimize manpower strain strategic you know initiatives to increase productivity and efficiency of entire organization multitasking multi skilling of the employees reworking on compensational benefits redesigning of training and development program reworking of weekly schedule shift schedule and make it more flexible to maximize production and minimize all overhead costing of the organization to identify key real key employees and to engage them in organization also to identify real top potential and to motivate and strengthen them for their development plans hr professionals must understand that employees have developed fear factor themselves for their family and their own health they are not sure about their jobs and their health constantly watching the negative news on the tv channels and on whatsapp groups they are worried about their future due to economic slowdown mm. it is the prime responsibility of hr professional to understand the same and to design a mechanism to develop a confidence amongst employees through proper communication and sharing them about the intention of the organization most important point in each and every hr professional must know and practice not to minimize the cost for the time being but to prepare organization stronger for the future growth differentiate between your good and average employees keep employees motivated and busy by constant communication communication and again communication with them show them realistic long term vision of organization layoffs are never easy ensure you are are familiar with legal aspect of the same be sure that you have properly defined criteria you are using to determine who will let go focus of management will be on cost optimization which is very crucial approach of management will not be to incur fixed liability any more and expect hr professionals to work on this and come out with innovative solutions such as fixed term employment gig employment for white collar employees apprenticeship program for blue collar and operative staff one of the critical task for hr professional is to evaluate work from home concept which is comparatively new in india as in some of the places employees have already demanding the rent since they are working from home electricity charges wifi charges etc going ahead to face such kind of an issues hr will have to prepare themselves for the same managing human resource function in economic slowdown environment is more demanding than during the rapid growth therefore task of hr professionals in my opinion is very important to maintain balance throughout the hierarchy thank you so much thank you mr kalkarni very valid points i think you really outlined some of the agenda for the hr professional to look at that and i think it's very important to as also bob pointed out i think we need to really uh, relook at ourselves in terms of competencies in terms of uh, uh, how do you upgrade ourselves in skills and uh, also look at how do we create that flexibility in 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 working and yet get that kind of high productivity but i think the important point is first of all to my mind is how do you convey that uh, feeling of comfort and confidence to your employees actually under the circumstances of fear anxiety isolation all leading to kind of a uncertain future i think that's perhaps the most important thing to make it make them comfortable and uh, then make them really give them an opportunity and 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 communicate with them very transparently i think that's perhaps the um, definitely the agenda for hr in the coming time thank you very much for your observations uh, may i now request uh, mr afif hussain from uh, maldives um uh, your uh, initial uh, some remarks uh, mr afif 
Yes, uh, great to hear from all of you. And I think the uh, the, the key point here is um, that you know this is a this is a great opportunity that we got as HR professionals. Um, you know, perhaps we may never get an opportunity like this in our lifetime again. Who knows? And why I say that is, I think there's been a lot of good practices within the HR or in all the spectrums of HR that we have been practicing. And there are some things that we always dream that we wish to wish to do, right? For example, there are a couple of points that I totally agree with what Bob mentioned and Damika, and for example, Bob just mentioned about, you know, uh, more equality at workplace. And I think there's something we have been, you know, advocating in all parts of the world. There's a lot of talk about it, but the actions are very less. So when we hit a pandemic like this, it just gives a wake up call and say, well, we have been talking about it for many, many years. Perhaps it's the right time to do something about it. Um, because if we don't do something about it now, then perhaps we will never get an opportunity again because it is easy in the human kind that, you know, when you're in the crisis, you're on the rush, rush, get things, you know, you know, you're in the energy of getting things done. When you get back to the, some sort of normalcy, you go back to the previous and say, okay, well, all right now. <laughs> so my first open remark is really we as all HR professionals, business leaders, this is a real opportunity we have. Um, and uh, you probably hear the word, you know, why let, uh, why we should let a good crisis, you know, uh, go as a waste. I mean, this is a good community. It is obviously very uh, sad what's happening in the world, but this is the reality. And I think, um, you know, when we look at, you know, when the last time the world had a pandemic like this and where we are today, the world is in a better place. So I think if we put our heads together and work together, you know, whether it's country level or whether state level, if you collaborate, city level, if you collaborate, region level, collaborate, and we aim to get things done, we will be able to get things done. But if we don't, I suppose in the long term, we'll regret. Um, just my second point is just specifically on the, uh, in, 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 in the point around working from home. Um, same, you know, probably same as I think in, in India, you have a huge, uh, you know, a number of employees and the employees in the technology. So I guess they probably would work from home. But in the Maldives, 80% um, of the economy is tourism industry. So obviously, a lot of people, they do not, you know, because you can't value a hospital. They have to serve and do this and do that. Some services can be done in the hospital, you know, from home. Um, but there are some sectors where they could have worked from home and they've always been saying, oh, no, it's not possible. We can't have people working from home. They won't be productive and you know, all this, all these reasons why they can't do it. And you know what happened? When the pandemic came, I mean, Morris is on lockdown for the last 75 days or so. Everybody is working from home. They get things done. And in fact, some of the employees that they thought were not productive were more productive from home. Uh, because, you know, when we, people work from home, you have to measure their, uh, you know, uh, productivity uh, based on what they do, based on the results. Um, so I think it has set a new standard that, you know, if we, because we know the concept of the working from home is not new. It has been there for many years, but it's just that our mindset that said, oh, well, you shouldn't do that, right? Um, and then the same thing with the use of HR technology, right? Uh, that, you know, I mean, uh, Damika mentioned about it. It was not a new new thing. It has been there for many, many years. But in the Maldives, again, some of the companies, they still follow this traditional ways of, you know, HR documentation process systems, procedures, even payroll. Um, and when the pandemic came, you know, you can't have your payroll person go to the office mm -hmm. to run the payroll. So they were forced to actually bring this back to workplace. And I, 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 I mean, I, what I've seen in the Maldives is just incredible changes. Uh, and people who said that they can't get things done that way because it should be done this way have taken a different way because that's the only way. Because, and my last point on this open remark is we as a child professionals have two choices. One is either we repeat or we evolve. If we repeat, after post-pandemic, we're going to get the same thing we used to get before. But I think if we evolve, or if we take new steps, I mean, the results, because of what we do, is just going to be extraordinary. So uh, 
but it all depends on us, what we do today and what we do to prepare. So that's my opening remark. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Afif. I think I, I recognize I, 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 the, the very fact that you look at this crisis as an opportunity reminds me of a recent um, uh, study undertaken by a, by a senior person in a company, in a private company, where they try to categorize the people um, as to how do they respond to this crisis. And he said that there are three categories. One is that uh, who, who are said, okay, oh, I can't do it because there's a problem, there's a crisis. Uh, and, and therefore, they are a one different category. The second category is those people who say that, well, I think I can do, I'll make an effort, effort for doing this thing. Uh, in spite of the crisis, I will definitely try it. So they, they have a chance. The third category, they say that I will definitely do this, whether it's a crisis or not, I'm going to do this. So I think that's the category that you are really there. And I think that's perhaps is the opportunity for HR people to look at that in spite of the crisis, they should look this as the opportunity to evolve ourselves to a next level. And I think that is very important. And, and you are right when you say that the, these changes have really forced people and perhaps made them uh, understand that their own capabilities that look, you can do like this also when you are forced to do that. And they have evolved into a new way of working. The work definition has changed. So I think that's very important. And that, that's how I think we should evolve and, and develop our practices for future as we, we believe that in the future, the work would be done differently, the businesses would be done differently. And therefore, we need to have process and system differently, which are suitable for that kind of future work. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Afik, and we'll come back to you again on, on certain questions. Thank you. Yeah. We, we'd like to move on to Mr. Arif uh, Salvaru from Mauritius. Can I request you for your some initial comments, please? Yes, thank you very much. Of course, I will do that. Uh, the case in Mauritius is quite um, a very difficult one. The um, airports are closed. The national airline company Air Mauritius is in the public administration. Mauritius depends a lot on tourism, the tourism sector. And uh, with no flights coming in and out, going out, and all the hotels and restaurants closed. It's quite a very um, difficult picture that we, we have in Mauritius. But um, mm -hmm. here is a time where HR people are regarded as the ones who can come up with uh, ideas, strategic uh, ideas, to make sure that we get things back and come to what we call this new normal. In Mauritius, the HR people have been really active during the look Before the lockdown, we have been very proactive in the sense that we were trying to guide organizations on how they should operate if there were going to be a lockdown. So that was done very successfully, and we have been highly regarded upon as uh, giving good advice to organizations how they should organize themselves to work during the lockdown. And during the lockdown, when it came, uh, it lasted for two and a half months. So HR people here were trying to make sure that their employees uh, keep the morale despite a very dark scenario, uh, motivate them and get them what we call create transparent communication with them, telling them what was ha happening. And then we sort of, when we saw that the lockdown was going to be lifted, so we all HR people were trying to get their members and business leaders to prepare themselves for what we call, we termed it, the next new normal. So we have been very active trying to say uh, what we, we need to do, which are the areas where uh, HR need to focus. And uh, now presently, uh, as we're speaking, we are actively being looked after for helping in how to mitigate the psychological impact of the lockdown, looking at areas where we can uh, help the organizations and its people to, to, to mitigate what we call the, the things like fear, panic, job losses, 
salary deductions and things like that. And uh, presently, presently we are sort of working closely with the authorities, with business leaders, trying to make sure that we have a relook at the Workers' Rights Act and bring some important changes in the in the in the laws governing employment relations and workers' rights uh, to make sure that we have the the right answers to how we uh, restart businesses. Uh, the the main ideas I think I'll agree with everyone who's been speaking uh, before me and even uh, Professor Rao, who I see is very active uh, on the on the media uh, right now, is that HR has to bring the organizations to get the basics right. What we mean by getting the basic rights mean we have always talked about health, safety, uh, security, and things like that. So this is an area where immediately we need to focus, make sure that people come to work safely. Those who work from home do it in the best conditions possible. They don't feel that like they are working in isolation. They need to feel that they are working from home, but not in isolation. And we've termed it also, uh, the future of work has already started. So if we say the future of work has already started, this future of work requires different skills, different competencies from HR professionals. So we need really to upskill ourselves first, then accompany businesses to reach what we call this new normal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arif, for very uh, pertinent observations on that. Um, thank you very much. We'll come back again for some questions. Uh, I'll, I'll start with my some um, question answer sessions and I'll, I'll request first to Bob. Um, Bob, can I ask a few questions to you? Of course you can. Yeah. So I think uh, with all that is happening and uh, we've discussed a few points briefly, um, do you think there would be a different way of doing work and business in the coming time post COVID? If yes, then um, what, what do you think, what would be the nature of that kind of business, that kind of operations, activities, how different it would be from pre COVID? And number two, uh, what kind of skills and competencies you think uh, people will have to have to be able to be more productive in the new way of working and new way of conducting business? Right. Um, uh, do we have about six hours to get through the answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's, first of all, I, I mentioned in my opening remarks about context and, and one thing that's very clear is uh, some of the things we're talking about won't apply to all industries. Some industries are very, very different. Some industries are absolutely ripe for new ways of working, which have been uh, accelerated by the disruption caused by the pandemic in terms of remote working, etc. There are other industries who are just not, um, their business model, their structural model is not set up to, to make these changes. So a lot will depend upon the nature and, and the type of business operation that people have as to whether um, new ways of working will come in. I, I think there are sort of three key questions for me. And when I look at the sort of whole future of work and what's going to happen post COVID, we, 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 we often just use this blanket expression of the future of work. I think we have to, we have to break it down and say, what is work itself going to look like? What's the workforce going to look like? And what's the workplace going to look like? Um, uh, and, and there are some key questions behind that. So, you know, in terms of the, the nature of the type and, uh, of our work is, will we, and something that has already been mentioned, uh, will we return to the same way we worked before the crisis? Or will we adopt new ways of working? So what's our mindset? Are we going to go back to what we did previously? Um, and the second thing is with, with the, the, the workforce is um, how will capability, and you mentioned about skills and so on, but affordability and productivity affect the design of our workforces? Um, you know, it relies very strongly <clears throat> on a large migrant workforce in some sectors. Um, other sectors, it's very much sort of local indigenous. So a, a lot depends on, um, you know, what's going to be affordable in some industries. Um, 
you know, it's okay to talk about everybody's going to work remotely. One of the interesting things is, um, certainly in Europe and the UK, is which businesses have been able to afford to do that. I'll give you a little example from Asia, by the way. Um, I do a lot of work with Patronus, and Patronus have to deal with it very, very rapidly. Um, large company that they are, but they weren't equipped for remote working. So they had to go out and source and buy the equipment, set up technology in a very, very short time frame. Uh, not all companies can afford to do this. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a whole issue around about um, the affordability. The other thing is, is that the jury is still out about productivity, about remote working. There are definitely some areas where people are being more productive, but we don't have any evidence. There is absolutely no um, analytical base at the moment for making those um, uh, conclusions. It's going to take some time. So just a, a note of caution about that. I think the third thing is, in, when you look at the workplace, is what have we actually learned about working in the virtual world? Because it blurs boundaries. Um, uh, I think both Arif and Dimika have both mentioned about the, the well-being, et cetera, of people. And what we're getting examples of, certainly in the UK, is presenteeism, um, which is people are staying online for incredible lengths of time. Um, into the evening and the night time, and, and uh, th this is counter to the, the, the health and well-being. So it's, you know, what we learn because the boundaries between work and home have now become blurred. There's no such thing as a work-life balance. Um, it's, it's how does it actually sort of operate? What do you choose to do? So there are, there, there, there are three very big questions, I think, that um, we have to answer. Uh, in terms of, you know, what's work going to look like? Is it really going to be sort of operating um, much more remotely? Are we going to be using far more digital technologies? Um, can we afford to use those technologies in some industries? Um, because I would, I would say that in some sectors, they can't afford to do it. Um, mm -hmm. so, so there's a whole range of questions there about the future of work. <clears throat> I'm absolutely sure there'll be some sectors which use this as a step change in how they operate. I know of one company in the UK which has realized it can save 200 million pounds a year by putting the majority of its workforce onto a remote basis. Very simple economics is that you don't need offices, you don't need buildings, you don't need services if you have your people working in a very different way. And a lot depends whether the industry <clears throat> is able to actually operate in that manner. Um, it has to be set up, the business model and the operating model, you know, th this, this applies really well, for example, with sales force. Uh, companies which have large sales forces, why do they need an office? Why do you have office premises when you can operate something uh, virtually? And in terms of, analyzing the uh, financials, um, this would incredibly increase cash flow in the business. Um, <clears throat> so there are those sorts of things we have to be thinking about, uh, but it is for me very sector dependent. Um, and you know, it's the caution I would say is there are some fantastic advantages to be had from this disruption uh, for HR to take a leadership role and to introduce new methods and approaches but we also have to be realistic about what's practical. Thank you. Thank you. Just on uh, uh, the thing, you think uh, there's a lot of emphasis by the companies right now on training and development of people <clears throat> um, internally to prepare them for working from home or uh, working in a different environment? Uh, one of the most <clears throat> rapid increases in... Um, marketing and offers has come from organizations offering to teach you how to work remotely. Uh, my, my inbox gets inundated with, with the, these offers and most of them quite frankly are very poor. Um, I think L&D, uh, learning and development departments have a key role to play here in upskilling people and under, I mentioned earlier that uh, HR is often the cobbler's children. We don't work on our own people enough but L&D functions um, this is a fantastic opportunity for them to start delivering 
um, not just remote working, but the step change is that, you know, for, for years we've talked about e-learning and e-learning has never really worked because there's not a proper social connection in it. Often the systems aren't very good, uh, all the stores and so on. But now with the advent of true digitization, and use of AI in e-learning, in their blended learning, <clears throat> there's a fantastic opportunity for learning and development people um, to really target and deliver right to the point of source um, the required training. So I think in some areas I've seen some fantastic examples of L&D stepping up to improve not just how people are working remotely, but how they've actually extended that into the whole upskilling of the workforce. Um, in other areas, I think we're just too slow. Uh, we're too wedded to face-to-face, -face, too wedded to saying we have to have a workshop. We know the evidence is incredibly strong that most of our traditional way and the past way we've done learning and development does not work. Mm -hmm. We have to look at the neuroscience uh, and the fact that physiologically and mentally, the human being can only do one task at once. And yet we run workshops, five day, 10 day, 15 day programs, business schools, have six weeks at Harvard, waste of time and money. You really need to, you're just educating. But in terms of true development, true training, it's short term, very concise, usually 10 to 15 minutes um, um, sessions which actually have the most impact. So L&D is going through an amazing transformation at the moment in some areas, but there's huge opportunities. Thank you. Just the last question on that. Uh, you think there are uh, no problems with respect to measuring individual employees' performance <clears throat> when he's working from home or in virtual working? Um, the process system that we used to use earlier and um, and now we want to apply on their performance because after all the compensation part um, need to be addressed uh, clearly for the employee's sake. You think there are problems in kind of assessing those? Yeah, I, I, I think- uh, What processes and all? Yeah, please. Yeah, I, I, I think there are problems. Um, I don't think we have um, clear enough um, and well-developed enough mechanisms to do that. Um, and also it's about, the perspective or the lens that we view productivity through. Are we viewing productivity from uh, presence and how many hours people spend on things? Some things are easily measurable, of course. It's the number of the amount of time you take to do a task. If you're in a call center, that's very easily measurable. Um, mm -hmm. If you're in a, a managerial job or a leadership role, where most of the time is spent thinking and processing it's a mental activity. How do, how do you assess that? And, um, unless you take a longitudinal view, a more longer term view of what the results are that people agree. I mean, one of the problems we have is that our productivity is still measured effectively on the basis of Frederick Taylor. <laughs> okay. we, still, we still use reward systems which are grounded from the early 1900s. We've never really got to grips looking at reward in a different way. And you know, one of the things is we need to step back and think about in the age of professionals is that, um, remember good old Maslow, Abraham Maslow, and his triangle of, of needs. And at the moment in our current environment, the very bottom of that triangle is the most important, which is safety and security and giving people a sense of community um, in, 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 you know, in, the, in the terms of their work and so on. So I think coming back to productivity, we haven't got very good measures. We've never had good measures. Um, <laughs> so there, there, there are, there are many, many, many examples of, of people following fads and fashions. I mean, the, the biggest one, of course. Uh, I, was I agree, I agree. Uh, one can never be satisfied with the performance measurement. No, no. But also, you know, the biggest one, Ashok, for me, um, people following the, the mantra of Jack Welsh and GE, mm. and force distribution of measurement and productivity in the workforce. How to disengage a workforce in, uh, in, in one fell swoop, um, he did it. Um, so anyway, but the thing is that I, there are lots of things happening at the moment in the UK. There's particularly a chap called Duncan Brown 
um, in the employment federations who's um, looking, who, a reward expert who's looking carefully at how we can actually shift the thinking of HR and HR's thinking as well. This is about management thinking um, and to looking at how we, we have productivity reward. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Um, um, I'll, I'll uh, now look forward to Mr. Fernando. Um, I know, Mr. Fernando, that um, Sri Lanka is today uh, one of the leading and emerging fastest growing economy. And uh, I see you were at a threshold of a double digit kind of a growth rate. Uh, suddenly this uh, problem has come up. Uh, I'd like you to perhaps uh, describe what you think has been the role of the leadership there. And when I talk about leadership, it's the, it's the top management, it is the CEO, it is all uh, critical uh, positions in a company, how they have been able to play that role um, in the present crisis in terms of uh, how do you overcome the challenges, how do you sustain the business uh, and, and, and minimize the impact. Uh, so the role of leadership and top management in the companies in Sri Lanka. Yeah, thank you, Ashok. It's a very pertinent question, but uh, I think uh, the GDP growth uh, of Sri Lanka since about last uh, five, six years or rather, seven, eight years, was, uh, it was there around, uh, somewhere around 10, 11, and uh, of course around 12, also if I may remember right. And uh, it's on a kind of a downward trend. Uh, and last year, you know that uh, we had this Easter Sunday terrorist uh, attack, which has uh, affected our uh, economy, uh, in unimaginable uh, proportions uh, because tourism is one of the industries that uh, Sri Lanka is also uh, uh, thriving upon. So the tourism got affected to a very great extent. Now, it, that by the time the COVID happens, the predicted uh, GDP was around three, three and a half to four percent. And now uh, it's been predicted that uh, mm -hmm. sometimes it might uh, drop by around uh, uh, three to three and a half percent. That means we will be uh, on, on the negative side of the curve. And uh, well, talking about the leadership, yes. See, uh, everyone uh, agrees that uh, this is unprecedented and no one has ever witnessed uh, any, kind, uh, any such uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, emergency. Uh, this COVID uh, uh, health emergency. However, you know, Sri Lanka has gone into a kind of a lockdown situation around March uh, 12th, I suppose. And from 12th onwards, uh, there have been curfew all throughout and only the curfews are uh, island-wide. It's been uh, lifted uh, just uh, the last week, end of last week. And uh, the leadership role, actually, what we had to play, play as me as the CEO also, how do we, uh, um, I mean, restart our organization first. So the first step is to uh, uh, liaise and negotiate with the governments as to how that the government can facilitate uh, in uh, starting our organization, especially I mean manufacturing. So, uh, as you all know, that you know we we've been talking about the uh, remote work. Uh, obviously, one of the areas which is manufacturing, which cannot be uh, run on remote. Uh, because people need to come and people need, need to work and produce. And how do we facilitate them? So this is uh, one of the things that we had. So what we have quickly done is uh, got together with the government and with the, with the uh, health authorities and the labor authorities to, uh, to uh, formulate a set of uh, policy guidelines, how to facilitate the uh, uh, work, on-site work during the pandemic. And that policy, policy guideline uh, has, you know, within a week or so that we could do, this, do that. And we had to contribute also. And later on, the, the, the comprehensive policy guidelines given, uh, I mean, uh, in, introduced by the uh, health ministry. 
Uh, but before that, uh, as even as a temporary measure that we, we could facilitate. So actually from the uh, second week of April, uh, we could start uh, work in manufacturing industry and also in certain other industries following those guidelines. As you may uh, understand that Sri Lanka's curve has been uh, kept quite uh, flat uh, for a long, long period um, because of such guidelines that we have followed. And of course, uh, the, the country has followed extreme uh, physical distancing measures as well. However, the current rise is uh, from the returnees, uh, those uh, expatriate returnees, and uh, we had a big pocket from uh, the Sri Lanka Navy. Uh, other than that, there were no any community spread per se. So uh, uh, by and large, uh, actually, uh, the, uh, main, the most important issue, I think, point is that uh, discipline of people when they're working and when they're coming okay. into work and uh, sort of things. And then uh, how, how we manage our import and exports because the imports are locked and uh, things are not running. And these things we have been needed to address, actually. Many of our organizations that... Uh, they have no no uh, revenue for the month of april zero revenue uh, especially uh, even right now the uh, hospitality sector especially the hotels restaurants and things uh, they have no income at all so then how you give give the leadership for the people side we have to look 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 at ba mainly the well being of people and then the business continuity how we address okay. business continuity while uh, looking after the well-being of people is a kind of a very, uh, uh, I mean, a changing thing. So uh, these things actually be addressed uh, in a, as I said, uh, uh, in a way that which is quite streamlined with regulations, so that uh, actually from the second week of third week of April, uh, most of the manufacturing organizations I'm talking related to manufacturing because I, I mean, I mean, I had the experience as well as uh, uh, being they are in for these policy making things and all that with the board of investment and many other organizations. So. Uh, that was one of the things that we could implement. And by, by the third week of April, we could bring about 50% of the workforce to the factories or the manufacturing concerns for on-site work. Okay. But they, they understand okay. because they'll need a lot of convincing and they understood that uh, uh, the uh, leaders, the organization can, can provide them uh, with the... Uh, with, uh, kind of uh, sanitary requirements, uh, health safeguarding their health and well-being. So that that is how the employees got convinced to come to work. Because even at even off work that they've been getting certain amount of salaries, but not the full salary, the full wages. And I think we can talk about those things later on. On those are the two areas I think uh, because we need to be, uh, for example, take HR. For, uh, HR needs to be the right hand, actually, at this kind of crisis to, for, to the CEO. Because if my HR people, my people managers, did not give given me that particular support required in deploying uh, staff and uh, getting them convinced uh, to come to work, uh, it would have not been a success. Mm -hmm. Now that actually the current situation is we are running almost at a uh, normal uh, level of uh, attendance. Mm -hmm. So you could you could motivate the leadership as you say very timely intervened and and took a very proactive uh, uh, actions uh, that, that's right some of the key things are especially communication as uh, communication. your president very correctly mentioned communication communication and communication Communication is most important. But while you're communicating, the communication <laughs> has to be simple, precise, transparent, and understandable to the people and must be convincing because that is how it will become most certain organizations. They have their own SMS portals and things like that so that you can make communication. But it has to be very precise. You know, uh, the wrong communication leads can, can lead you to different sorts of trouble during this kind of a period. And earlier, 
uh, I think Afif mentioned about uh, the, the how you can make use of a, 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 a troublesome situation. And I, I call it, uh, you know, uh, thriving turbulence. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I can understand that, you know, um, under the crisis, it, it takes a lot of efforts to really motivate people to be able to be convinced to come and work under the crisis. So I think uh, uh, really compliments to the leadership there that they could communicate transparently, uh, right things, uh, looked after them. And I think you're right that the first from the focus was on the livelihood, um, life, livelihood, health. And then it came on the business, how business could be salvaged and, and, and continued on that. Thank you very much. Um, I'll now request uh, Mr. Kulkarni. Um, uh, Mr. Kulkarni, you know, we know that the way of working now is that uh, most of the organizations are trying to promote as much as possible uh, work from home in the virtual working. Uh, under those circumstances, uh, uh, while the, there is still a crisis going on and we don't have any clarity on when it, the, the uncertainty would end, so there, are, there is an amount of little fear among the employees, uh, anxiety in the things, and also the isolation to some extent when they work from home or some virtual office. So this is all uh, has, has an impact on the health of the employee. And there are uh, some psychological health issues that are developing. Um, how do you see how the companies are managing how do you see in your organization and, and uh, in general in India, the companies are looking at uh, addressing these health issues? See, uh, first of all, when you ask somebody to work from home, he has a fear that uh, you know, he may be not uh, required in the organization. Because uh -huh. we are used to first such kind of atmosphere firstly. Only few IT companies have uh, work from home concept. But now with this COVID-19, most of the organizations are thinking how they can do that to work from home. But the mindset of this employee is feeling that I'm maybe I'm a surplus, I'm on the bench, I may not be required in the organization, that's why the organization is not involving to come to the offices. With this two months of lockdown period, now everybody feels that he should go and attend the office. Hmm. He will be in that mainstream, he will understand what is happening. When you sit at home, you don't understand what is happening in the organization, where, which direction it is going, what is going to happen in future. So this is something very tricky and I think very tough uh, task for the uh, HR professional even to evaluate. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very, because the change of mindset has to be there. The HR need to give the confidence that the work from home is not that it is an isolation, mm -hmm. it's not that he is separated from the organization, it is not that process of that started to isolate him from the organization of the mainstream, but it is the kind of a requirement of the present situation or whatever the best we can do from the work from home, we should be able to do that. This is a change in working atmosphere. So that creating a mindset, giving the confidence, always communicating what is happening in the mainstream, what is happening in the organization, what is happening in the office. You have to always keep him communicating that these are these are the things which are happening, and you are a part of that. You are not an isolated. I think that confidence is more important at this moment, which HR professional should share to these employees. Yeah, I think you are right, but I think what Mr. Fernando said that uh, you need to also communicate with the employees and engage them. And um, I think it cannot be always the work. Work from home does mean that on, not only work. Uh, uh, and from that point of view, how do you keep them engaged? How do you keep them fit and fine? I think there are companies which are um, sort of circulating certain advices like uh, you know, certain recommendations given by WHO in terms of how the employees working from home uh, should focus on that, on, on their how they keep themselves agile, uh, alert, and, and divide their time in the work on the system or otherwise on this. They also very strongly recommend uh, activities like uh, gaming. I came across one of the Australian company which uh, through a WhatsApp 
um, asked all employees to draw a figure and gave instruction. It was, uh, uh, it continued for uh, two, two, two and a half hours, but uh, they wanted them to draw a kangaroo actually. And they gave instruction. It was a very sort of uh, um, happy activity where, and changed the mindset to a more, you know, collaborative thing. So I think to my mind, uh, uh, some advice and the WHO has given instructions as to what organization should uh, recommend to employees and what kind of activities they can take up, how they should be um, practicing those. I think it would be a good idea to really um, share with us. Um, yes. can, you, can, can you also share some of these specific uh, examples uh, of your HR initiatives uh, specifically driven by HR team in the organization in the COVID or uh, ongoing crisis or they have planned something for the future? Yeah, I, I just share. The Axis Bank, what they have done is they have uh, offered the virtual meditation. Uh -huh. Meditation, online learning modules and informal virtual team catch-ups among other to keep employees with their model up. Then the organization like uh, Bosch, Asian Paint, in this kind of a situation where the industry is having really a slowdown, they signed a wage settlement. They increased the salary of the people just to boost their model and saying that we are, uh, we are there, you don't worry, we will, we will go forward, this phase will also go. So to boost that model that they use such kind of a concept, the RPG group, they have undertaken the group-wide physical, psychological, emotional wellness drive, including online access to the doctors, nutrition advice, Zoom calls, and ensure social connect and online mindful sessions. Wonderful. The organization like Bajaj Electrical, they have allowed their employees who have the children below five years of old, they said, you, you be work from your home. Whatever your function, you can work from home, you can take care of your family. So I think these are the, some of the HR initiatives which really uh, boost the morale of the employees and you can give the comfort feel to them. Okay. Thank you. I think these are some of the things that can be shared with uh, all, all the other companies here and the participating panelists. Maybe we can learn from them as well on some of the initiative taken by certain companies in their country. Thank you very much, Mr. Kulkarni. Um, i like to um, come to Mr. Hussain Afif from Maldives. Um, yes. Uh, I know Maldives, again, is a basically um, um, a country which is so famous for tourism and um, hospitality and uh, is a favored, preferred destination for many. Um, yeah. With this uh, kind of a thing, we can imagine uh, if it uh, all stops there, uh, how the employees are going to uh, be impacted. So my question is that uh, what happened to those employees who are uh, duly employed in the hospitality section, aviation section, and related services, uh, where they were not uh, being employed and that activity was closed, uh, were there any layoffs? pay cuts or, or uh, pink, pink uh, slips or how, how you manage those? Yeah, well, uh, more than you know, the, this is the like 80% of our, you know, uh, GDP is tourism um, business or business related hospitality. Out of every 10 um, people that are employed, six jobs are related to hospitality industry. Direct either resorts or hotels or airport, I mean, all the uh, services in the within the ecosystem of um, the hospitality industry. And there are, uh, we have 154 resorts, and in the Maldives, you know, it's, you know, if you have been to Maldives, you probably know, if not, every island is a resort. So it's one island, one resort, so it's not connected to cities. So you basically have your, your privacy, and you, know, you, you have your good holiday there. All these resorts are closed, uh, 27th of March, all of them closed because we closed the border, um, and which means, that there's no tourists coming. So in the last 75 days, there's been no tourists coming to Maldives. Um, there's no commercial flights. Obviously, we do have you know a couple of you know, charter flights for essential needs. So what did we do with the employees? 
Uh, and I think the uh, one of the point that was, I think, if I'm uh, correct, uh, if I recall correctly, I think it was highlighted by uh, Bob. You know, it's just amazing to see that some of the world's best brands and companies, they don't have a cash flow to support employees just even for two to three months. I mean, the last 10 years, they, and, you know, it's, 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 and I think we have had the same impact. In the mall this year, every big brand in the world, you know, I mean, you have the Four Seasons, the Risk Cardinals, the Intercontent, the Marriott, and what have you. So what we did was obviously as a best practice in most of the resorts, we, you know, somehow we try to manage by obviously, you know, we send all the employees back home, but we're in a way possible. We still have quite a large number of expatriates stuck in the malls because there's no flights for this part. Uh, the good news is that I think the Indian government is having this uh, massive operation of repatriation. So since, since 1st of June, even from the Maldives, there's every day 400, 500 Indians going back to their country. Um, and, and I must say, it is a, this is a very good, you know, initiative and uh, perhaps a great example for many other countries because the scale of this is just unprecedented. I mean, they have ships coming, taking 700 people every day. So it's quite amazing. But um, so what we did was we, because we closed in March, so we, most of the resorts, we actually, um, agreed that, okay, we don't know when the economy is going to open. So we send everybody on, 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 on leave. Um, and 80% of the resource chose to pay uh, for three months, which means you get a sort of a pay cut. So if your salary is there, you know, you, you, know, you get a 20% pay cut. So for three months, you'll be on. There were some resorts um, who are not probably a big chain, but like one individual on property, they chose to send people on unpaid leave. Um, uh, but the good thing is, I would say 90% of the employers, they really took care of their people. As you know, in the hospitality business, we say that, you know, we got to look after our people if they have to serve our guests in the manner that we, we want it to be. So we did take care of them. But now the bigger question is, what do we do afterwards, right? So there were, initially there were no, not a lot of job loss, but I think because the salaries were deducted, it will have a huge impact on the lives of the people you know, people who are staying in rented houses and capital cities. So there's a lot of, you know, change in the uh, way that the people are living. So a lot of people in the capital city, Mali, those who don't know the capital of Maldives is the most congested capital city in the world. Um, it is very small, uh, but you have 120,000 people living there. So a lot of people who, who got this reduced pay, they couldn't afford the rent, they moved to islands because in your island, you don't have to pay rent. You live in your home or with your family. So there has been some interesting scenarios around like that. Um, and also a lot of expatriate workers left from the Maldives. It's questionable whether all of them will return because they've been with their home for three months. And I think for uh, those workers who left uh, to India, Sri Lanka, and um, over you know, 50 different countries, you know, being with your family for three months, it's easier in those countries to find to do something. Maybe you may not have the same amount as before. So people may not consider coming back. Um, they, they, they certainly, they say, well, it's, I mean, and I, and I think one good thing I, I am seeing in this is that a lot of people are finding the value of being a human being because you're with your family, you spend time. So, uh, you know, if you can earn something back at home and manage it, why go to a foreign country and be there for a longer time when most of these workers can't go back to their home even for one or two years, right? So there will be changes like that. Um, now the challenge we are dealing now as we speak today, in fact, I, uh, you know, even for our company where we're deciding on the same tomorrow, what do we do if we don't open in July? Because our pay packages are up until July and companies do not have enough cash flow. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, in not just us, any company, they just don't have. In the Maldives, the banking sector is not very strong. So we do not have a lot of, you know, um, you know uh, programs that can support these businesses, right? So um, very likely that if resource can't open in July, uh, because from what I see right now in the tourism industry, at the beginning of July, there will be some domestic travel in most part of the world, and it started in some areas now. August, it will be a lot of regional travel. So, for example, like from India to Maldives, Maldives to Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka to, you know, Nepal and like that. And then international travel will start 
as earliest as in September, October. This is the estimation even by the, uh, you know, the global, you know, trend setters and companies that talks about it. So if we open in October, we'll have to find a way to support the employees in three, four months. That's when the impact is going to start count. So we, but we are doing our best to see how we can support uh, national wise. It's going to be tough, um, but obviously, um, or, or resources, if they consider opening, they will also have to see how they can open on a lean operation model. Because in hotel industry, there are not many areas where you can have people working from home. Reservations, you can make them work from home. Sales, few people. Mm -hmm. the, uh, but the remaining got to be on the island to serve the people, right? But that's yeah. the uh, business. So. Yeah, yeah uh, but Afid, do you think there was some, some percentage of people who migrated were redeployed in some other sectors? Uh, they found other job, number one. Number two, was there any government support, like workers have some kind of a, a assured pension or something if they lose a job? Anything support coming from the government? Yeah. So we had this, um, you know, the uh, obviously, uh, going back to the first question that you mentioned, um, you know, I, I'll give a one example, and that's sort of, a, you know, an example that, kind of the stories that you'll find in the world. There, there was, a, uh, you know, in the resort, you have the engineering department and there was an AC technician. So he went back home and because he got a reduced pay, you know, he had the skill of AC technician, repairing ACs. So he started going houses in his neighborhood and repairing their ACs and he would start getting like 10 to $20 for each service. So in a month he could earn three to $400 uh, and he said, well, if I can do this, even post pandemic, why do I have to go back to the resort? Because in the resort, I'm earning $300. So there has been some interesting stories like that. There were people who are waiters in the resort industry that used to earn $350 per month. And they went back to their home island. And the second largest industry in the mall is fishing. And they started going to fishing. And they would earn, I mean, on a good week, they would earn $250 per month, uh, sorry, per, per week from fishing by selling their catch. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, well, why should I go back to the resort? So there will be some changes like that. I think it's still early to predict. But I'm very optimistic. People will want to stay with their family if they can get a good, good, good earning. Um, and I think this pandemic has given people the opportunity to, to try things different way. In terms of the government support, um, yes, definitely there, there, there has been uh, quite some sort of support uh, by by the government, um, but you know it's it's not it's not enough. So I don't think it'll be enough anywhere. Um, but also because in the modest the in terms of the banking uh, sector and you know the the Federal Reserve, um, it's 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 not as strong as other countries in the Asia or Southeast Asia. So uh, I believe they do have a lot of challenges in giving support every single area. But the government has, for the first time in the Maldives, have introduced uh, in a short term an unemployment allowance, which is about $400 per person for those who lose their job. So, so they, this is great because there's no such thing like that. Our labor law doesn't have any unemployment benefits. So they immediately create a, uh, you know, under presidential decree, they came up with, uh, uh, with that order and uh, they're doing it. So the overall well-being of the people has been the priority, I think, um, in the last couple of months from an HR perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hussain. Um, that was very enlightening. Uh, I'll, I'll request Mr. Arif now. Um, uh, I see Mauritius also something similar where you have uh, a very large tourism and hospitality industry. Uh, you think the situation is more or less similar to what was in uh, experience in Maldives, or you think there are certain uh, different trends in Mauritius? Some similarity there is, uh, but I, I'll start by asking Altif if, if he's still listening to me. Uh, you're using the MAHRP, and it resembles the one we have in Mauritius. Yeah. In Mauritius, yes. although it is MAHRP. <laughs> so we now need Find out yeah, we, we should we should partner very soon. I uh, and you know, in fact, I I work for a merchant company. You probably know Luxide and Resorts. So 
I, I actually do visit Merz often. I look forward to catching up with you after this panel. I think it's, it's good to see you today. <laughs> Let's hope we do that, yeah. Yes, uh, in fact, we do have some similarity with Maldives. Tourism sector is, uh, is one of the main uh, source of revenue for Mauritius. We, as I told you, in Mauritius now is ground, grounded and the hotels, all of them are closed. They have been used as quarantine areas during the lockdown. We have had 335 cases uh, of uh, coronavirus in Mauritius, 10 deaths, and uh, actually uh, all the merchants, the locals, are being repatriated from abroad, London, Paris, and other parts of the world, uh, Mumbai, Delhi. So they stay in quarantine hotels, and we actually have three cases in the quarantine areas. So which means that uh, locally there are no cases now for one and a half month. All the cases that we, we, we have three cases and all three of them are imported cases. Uh, this, uh, you were talking about government um, assistance. In fact, in Mauritius we have had what we call the wage assistance scheme. In March, the government paid half of the salary. Okay. In April and May, they paid 100%, up to a maximum of 25,000 rupees. So which means that organizations, business organizations, have in some way benefited from, from this wage assistance scheme. We have also created a social scheme where everyone losing their job or being put on leave without pay or being given some social uh, monetary assistance that okay. will be there for another six months okay. and uh, this has brought about what we, we call uh, in what we call the business world a big paradigm in fact um, we were all looking for less and less government intervention in businesses mm -hmm. and this COVID uh, scenario is pushing business organizations now to look for government interventions uh, they are they are waiting for changes in laws, changes in, as I t told you earlier on, in the Workers' Rights Act, in Work, Work Relations Act, in what, what we have to pay, the, the redundancy board, how we go there. Do we have exemptions and we don't have to go there and still uh, lay people, people off? So there's a big expectation from the business world on what we call government interventions. It's a, it's a big paradigm shift. We were early on talking about flexibility, less government interventions. <laughs> now, businesses are looking towards government interventions. Uh, I think that answers part of your yeah, first I question. Yeah, I just want to other than uh, the hospitality, uh, what would be the kind of percentage of people who are working from home or from uh, in a virtual office uh, uh, as, as a normal way pre-COVID in, in uh, Mauritius? Uh, during the lockdown period, only the essential services were allowed to move around, which means the health sector people, police and uh, media. Apart I, from that... I, my, my question is that uh, pre-COVID, uh, what, uh, what is the kind of uh, strength of people? Was it popular to work from home or was there at all any work from home style pre-COVID in Mauritius? Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the government introduced it in uh, 2014. Okay. It was part of the law. So yes, many organizations do uh, were, were uh, having um, this remote working system in place. But the COVID situation uh, accelerated it. And in fact, uh, it was like 90% uh, work was done remotely and 10% okay. are need done on workplace. And post-COVID, we still see it. We are now in a situation of, let's say, 60, 40. 60 uh, at workplace, 40% from home. From home. Oh, that's a huge uh, change. And I think a welcome change, perhaps. Yes, that's why I said uh, we have already started the future of work. Uh, in fact, the... COVID lockdown period was like a, a, a world experiment for the work from home 
arrangement and see uh, it had its its teasing problems we i think bob uh, rightly talked about no barrier between personal life and professional life so we have learned uh, our lessons from there and hr has this challenging role of uh, ensuring that we have this right divide of those who work from home and those who work at the workplace and then how do we organize uh, both sides eh? the workplace and the work from home in fact that will be one of the skills of uh, hr uh, very soon how we redesign work okay thank you very much uh, 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 for sharing your thoughts uh, and i think it's a very welcome change happening in mauritius and all the best to the 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 organizers uh, uh, business leaders the hr professional there and i think uh, you are you are in a in a, in a very fast changing uh, environment there thank you very much okay. and uh, at this point in time uh, uh, dr sahu um, do we propose to launch uh, this thing we are not able to really uh, have time for so many other questions that we had uh, thought about <laughs> regarding the uh, uh, worker uh, regulations and other uh, uh, employment uh, uh, rules regulations and all i think maybe some uh, some other time we'll look at that uh, right now do you think is the right time for launching the um, that tool yeah yeah before the question answer session we can uh, launch this sir uh, this is a uh, a short video uh, created by nipm for young professionals and because the time is now that all interviews will take place through virtual mode only kindly on your permission it will be launched sir so just to tell you that this is a kind of uh, initiative taken by nipm to really help the uh, new emerging uh students uh, trying to join the professional life um in the change scenario we certainly feel that uh, the way the interviews will be conducted would be different the interaction conducted would be different so to help them prepare an ipm has come up with a good idea to really give them a a little uh, training a little tip on how they should be doing it uh, after this we'll have some time for question answer so we'll come back to the question answer session on this uh right now i'm very happy to really see this uh, new initiative being launched by nipm and compliments again to the president and the entire team the secretary general and the national council team thank you sir this now we can launch that now please yeah here it goes hello friends today we are going to see how to prepare for video interview Job interviews can be nerve-wracking, especially if you are meeting the hiring manager for the first time via webcam in your living room. Since video interviews are typically faster, easier, and more cost-effective than an in-person meeting or long phone call, many companies are now using them to expedite the hiring process. The key problem with video interviews, though, is that job seekers don't know how to do them. So let's check some tips for video interviewing. number of apps generally used for video interviews need to be downloaded and one should be familiar with the same like skype zoom say namaste and others number 1 recheck your audio video and internet connection always test your video and audio right before an interview to ensure everything is working properly a stable wireless connection is also essential so be sure to choose a location where you know spotty connection won't disrupt your video number 2 a distraction free background You want a clean, sterile environment when you are doing a video interview. The main thing you are trying to do in an interview is communicate on a human level. So, you have to make it easy for people to focus in on you. Number 3, make sure you are in a well-lit room and the interviewer can see you clearly. People often have just one overhead light shining down on them from the ceiling, but this creates shadows and can be unflattering. aim to have one light coming from behind you one light on your right and one light on your left to create a glow around you number 4 angle and eye contact are critical where do you look during a video interview it's one of the most common questions people have always position your camera at eye level not above or below you the psychology behind it is if i am looking down at the camera 
आई एम लुकिंग डाउन एट द हायरिंग मैनेजर एंड दे फील सबसर्वियन नंबर फाइव फ्रेम योर सेल्फ फ्रॉम द चेस्ट अप द ट्राइंगल फॉर्म फ्रॉम द टॉप ऑफ योर हेड डाउन टू योर शोल्डर्स इज द फोकल पॉइंट बिकॉज ऑल ऑफ योर कम्युनिकेशन इज गोइंग टू बी कमिंग फ्रॉम योर फेस योर इमोशन योर एक्सप्रेशन योर स्माइलिंग and that's what is going to get you the job number 6 dress for the job you want you always want to look your best for an interview and prepare the same as you would for an in person meeting your dress and level of formality should match the industry for which you are interviewing keep makeup natural looking and avoid wearing too much jewelry which can be distracting and catch light from the wrong angle choose clothing colors that complement your skin tone and make sure your clothing melts well with the background as well number 7 keep your body language open just as with an in person interview it's important to be cognizant of your body language in order to leave a positive impression on the interviewer you are creating an image of yourself as soon as you turn on your camera you want the person to like you and hire you so smile If you look frozen or scared for your life, why would they hire you? Number 8, document submission. At the time of actual interview, the document submitted must be the same as the one you have submitted at the job portal office. A candidate should keep a copy of CV in front of him as just a reference at the time of an interview. Number 9, think of it as a show. One of the great digital executive and author of The Essential Digital Interview Handbook Paul J Bello tells his clients to think of video interviews as one man studio of shows with the audio video lights and everything else you want to realize that we are building a studio you are the star you have to prepare because you are the sound person you are the light person you are the camera person you are the copyright person you are the makeup artist you are everything to put this show on that's it my friends i hope you are feeling confident and prepared for your video interview ah uh, thank you congratulations very nice uh, dr sao yeah, very nice to meet you i think uh, compliments to you and an ipm well done thank you sir i i think uh, uh, on the question answer uh, front uh, yeah can we can you please uh, uh, pick up question dr sahu yeah uh, in fact we are very happy that uh, uh, dr tv rao is there with us and uh, he has a very interesting uh, uh, points he, he, he has in the chat box his put people want more equality and he has a very interesting view on work from home and other so i am i am unmuting uh, rao sir uh, please uh, you unmute yourself i have uh, given that rao sir yeah please please pleasure to have dr rao on on uh, as a one of our participants here uh, really look forward to your observation dr rao it's a long time that we haven't really met you you may uh, unmute yourself sir there should be a uh, microphone uh, icon okay yeah i got it now yeah yes. i just it was muted well thank yes. you very much I mean, this is a surprise for me that you have you are asking me to uh, i was merely agreeing with the points made by many speakers particularly bob then kulkarni saab and then is very educative both from mauritius as well as from maldives and sri lanka i think i agree totally with all the points that are made i i have no questions. but for agreeing with this i think hr needs to be very creative uh, have think out of the box only suggestion i am making is do not trust to make uh, policies on work from home because uh, work from home just don't take the it experience as uh, the typical experience i think we need to understand uh, the various factors that influence work from home can be very productive provided it suits people for some people it suits some for other people it doesn't we need a lot of research so the requirement from hr is in each city and in each country i think you will have to conduct your own research 
and come up with your findings and then uh, rather than formulating policies make framework or policy guidelines because the moment you make policy what happens is it starts hurting some people for whom it doesn't suit suitability means i think we have parents at home parents in laws children neighborhood is not right your infrastructure is not right i think here the experience of iits who started online education in the last 3 4 months both the bombay and delhi i am told they have decided not to pursue this because it creates a lot of equality issues and so on for some people the accessibility is not there these are all lessons so i am very happy to have listened for the last uh, couple of hours to each and every speaker uh, excellent uh, points that are made i only want to say by saying that to me hr profession is even above the medical profession medical profession looks after the lives of people whereas hr is required to look after the lives and the livelihood it's not easy it's a, it's a lot of upskilling is required which i think some of the speakers have mentioned very nice sir dr balin has asked very relevant questions very educative for me i have no questions only a comment and thanks for giving me this opportunity thank you very much uh, dr rao uh, wonderful uh, suggestion on the uh, work from home just a, just a uh, recent study you might have also come across uh, one of our uh, very um, active uh, hr professional has come up with an idea after some survey based uh, work where he has said that uh, where he conducted a, a good uh, amount of survey um, and then uh, came up with the recommendation that uh, today under covid that at least three generations of people are working in the same environment yeah that's right three yeah. generations were earlier having different way of working different thought process and therefore it was difficult for them to work on the same line but now today they are working and he is calling them as the reset resilient reset generation where uh the three generation are exactly working on the same way so i think that's a positive thing that people can really work on that but i do agree um this may not be same thing may not be suitable for another person what is suitable for person a may not be really true for b and i think it is a well said suggested thing that we must do lot of research uh, uh actual research uh, uh and large base research to really come up uh with some kind of a guidelines and uh, uh, some recommendations only not really policy we are not really uh, uh, right now prepared for policy paper thank you very much dr rao uh, thank you sir there is a question from uh, dr arun chinna uh, dr arun chinna i am unmuting you if you are there otherwise i'll read the question dr arun chinna are you there please unmute yourself yeah please put the question it is about what role hr should play fast cope with retention challenges and over uh, you dr sinha are you there yeah yeah please put the question please put the question hello yeah yeah you, you are audible please put the question the question is that uh, during this uh, covid 19 this has the impact on the business so in the hr role what should be the hr role in making the talent pool how to retain these people because there will be competition and the many people will who the people from the competitive organizations in for the betterment of their organization and secondly the migrant workers who has been Who has been there and they have come back to their places? How to deal with them? How to ask them? How to that's retain them? How a, to invite them for them? So that's a that's a that's a very much India specific uh, issue. Um, I would request Bob if you can take up uh, the question. Is that uh, under the we have been discussing this, of course, that uh, uh, the specific uh, question is how HR can retain can take initiative. for retaining the talent under covid crisis situation what can be done by hr to retain them what steps can be taken can you can you please take up on this bob yeah sure um there's a couple of examples i can give you which are 
um, largely European. Uh, there, there are some in um, Asia as well. But um, what's come into play is, is that, um, and there's a little bit of context here, in that, <clears throat> for example, in Europe, there's a lot of furlough programs and companies have been supported by the government up to 80% of their wages, up to two and a half thousand pounds a month. It's costing billions. And one of the interesting things that's happening here is, is that this support is mainly going to lower paid workers, not mm -hmm. to higher paid. Course, so yeah. we've been looking and we've done a, We've just done a survey at CIPD in the last week or so, just a, a testing survey to see what's actually happening. Um, and, and clearly what's going on is there are some sectors where the managers, the higher paid employees, are still being paid. So retention for them is not a particular issue, unless, of course, the business is going bust and uh, <laughs> what you're going to do with them. Um, but also there are some sectors where they're paying retention payments. Okay. They're, they're, they're actually sort of saying, we will add a bonus um, at, at, you know, at the end and, of three. And, and Bob, that would be how much in terms of percentage of the normal remuneration? It, dep it depends on the sector. Um, as you can imagine, the banking sector is the highest percentage. Um, mm -hmm. they, they all already have very high bonuses. But typically, I know of a chemicals company which is adding a bonus of 10%. Um, and, and of course, these things are all relative. But in, in terms of these employees, this is a significant amount of money in the UK. Um, but it's been targeted because what's happening is there are some companies which are acting uh, in this crisis in a very predatory manner. They're targeting talent. They're trying to steal it, recruit it um, into their own environment. So there's some HR practices which, quite frankly, as an HR professional, I find very questionable at the moment, uh, taking place in some areas. Uh, on the other hand, there are some fantastic practices taking place. But in terms of retention, it's not just about money. Um, it's, very, it's, it's very much about how much close contact are you maintaining with your top talent? Mm -hmm. how, much, how many conversations are you having with them? I know of several organizations where they've organized a weekly um, coffee session, virtually that is, <laughs> coffee and cake. But they're, they're actually trying to replicate the, um, you know, the, the coffee station conversation over a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. So there's a lot of work going in beyond just about, this is not just about paying money. It's about are we maintaining the contact? Are we discussing with these people what the impact is? Are we involving them enough in, in the future of the business and so on? So there's a lot can be done in HR. I know one HR department which organized a very interesting um, a round robin with all of its leadership team for all their top talents. So okay. there, there are a number of initiatives you can take which don't just involve money. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, well said and uh, very, very well uh, elaborated. Any other panelists uh, would like to add on anything uh, that? I think, I think I would like to add on the migrant worker issue. Yes, good condition. Because uh, on behalf of NIPM, we have made a representation to the Ministry of Skill Development. The migrant worker issue is a burning issue in India. And now what is happening that post-COVID, a lot of new job roles are coming. So what we have suggested first is that where the migrant workers camp, because in many places, they are not yet allowed to come inside the villages or even the boundaries of the state. So there are a lot of camps which have been now based in as a migrant worker camp. So in each camp, we should have some skill development and skill orientation program for the programs like uh, health, health sector is now coming up. So rural health sector, then the because of this COVID, we have used to have the everything is online, whether your grocery, whether your food, everything is online. So the uh, demand for the delivery boy and demand for the delivery entire logistics sector have been increased to give the training to the migrant workmen in these kind of a sectors, which are newly coming up sectors, like insurance, health insurance sector, health workers, the delivery boys, the logistics sectors. And then you place them in that rural sector where they should not come back again to the place since they don't have any opportunity in that particular area why they are being migrating. 
so these kind of i think some initiatives when we are taking i think it will have definitely some impact on the migrant worker issue and secondly since the migrant worker has already migrated there is a vacuum in the industry there is no people in the industry so training to the local people up to that level where they can have some skills we can they start with the industry and then they can gain the again the skill and the reskilling can happen so i think these two major aspects the government must take and i think on behalf of nipm we already made the representation and we'll be following up with them thanks sir thank you mr kulkarni i like to add on here the government of india has a has several schemes to help the uh, worker now we all know that in india uh, above 90% of the worker force is in the um, unorganized sector only the a small amount is in the organized sector so government has one scheme where it is a a minimum uh, pension that is given to a a, a worker once uh, he in case he loses his uh, 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 job uh, uh, 1000 rupees is the minimum which is under active consideration and there are a lot of representations to enhance it the other is that government has also given uh, assurance of minimum 100 days employment uh, under the manrega scheme wherever they are going so i think they will have uh, some sustainability some support from the government of india schemes for all the workers the problem was that uh, it was a emotional decision perhaps by the majority of the workers uh, out of fear anxiety and perhaps uh, no clarity on the future by 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 their employers previous employers on their work so they they thought it is perhaps under circumstances the only way is to move to their houses their homeland and therefore this kind of a large migration of the labor but i think some of the companies have been successful in retaining them few of their employees also and they are perhaps a good example to really see how they have been able to do that but i think from their uh, uh, from their sustainability point of view the government of india scheme at least uh, supports them to some extent although it may not be really sufficient for a worker to sustain the entire family but certainly uh, would be some help on that thank you uh, dr sau another yeah. question yeah uh, another question from uh, mr tusar desai is asking to all panelists in post covid 19 era will robotics help to achieve industry 4.0 to become a char business partner in robotics yeah so i'll i'll again uh, come to first to bob uh, bob what are your thoughts on this um, automation artificial intelligence and now the robotics how how um how much it can influence really working um <laughs> again i think you have to step back a little and and um look at the context look at the sectors that are involved uh-huh. um uh, um you know for example using um uh robotics in the hospitality sector it might work in japan and it does work in japan actually uh you can get your tea served by a robot but um in most <laughs> of the countries it doesn't work very well so a lot depends on the sector um there's no doubt that ai will 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 increase across all sectors uh and if you're looking at hr jobs for example there are certain hr jobs at the moment which ai can already do um and and the jobs i think in the hr sort of sector for example if i was in compensation and benefits i'd be expanding my skills into other areas at the moment because most comp and ben can be done with algorithms um and interactions with um and that is already happening in 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 some companies in the states particularly so a lot a lot depends on the, the type of role but in hr ai will will certainly speed things up in some areas in recruitment it's already been used uh, and in some cases it's been used very effectively and in some cases it's been used almost immorally um because you know ai can be very intrusive in terms of the types of conclusions and questions and so on it answers and there's certainly an outfit in the states which is using it um and i think it's been banned now from using it they were using keystroke um um sort of monitoring uh-huh. when people were doing recruitment online so they were looking at their keystrokes using ai 
uh, to, to draw conclusions about whether they were really interested or whatever. They also used the same technology, by the way, in HR in the States to look at those people who they thought would be leading the company. Now, uh -huh. all that, um, you know, these, these are true stories and, and, and reprehensible. On the other hand, there, there are certainly um, huge advantages for AI in speeding up processes, um, and some processes in HR will become completely redundant, I think. Um, in the broader sense of robotics and digitization, um, a lot depends on the sector. <clears throat> there is a real issue about affordability. Some sectors can afford this, other sectors cannot. They just don't have the, the level, you know, not every company is an Infosys, not every company is a Tata, not every company is Dr. Reddy's or Piramal or whoever it happens. You know, these people have got some money. There are a majority of our organizations are small, medium-sized enterprises. And we must remember when we talk about HR sometimes, we tend to look at through a, 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 at HR through a lens of the bigger organization. 80% of our organizations worldwide are small. They Got cannot it. adapt some of these technologies very quickly. So, but I, I think um, there's no doubt that um, everything that's happening in terms of AI and digital <clears throat> will speed up and improve some practices um, in some organizations, but it will be for me very sector dependent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well said. I think uh, I see that in some of the areas you're right, like uh, automotive sector, uh, yeah. certain hazardous industry, I would say, um, uh, the robotics is becoming very popular. Uh, otherwise, all those in the HR field, if you see a kind of a chatbots and uh, yeah. AI, uh, you know, enabled uh, activities are perhaps being becoming popular now. In that. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, can we move to the next question? If you have time, Sak yeah, Sahu, please. please uh, no, sir, uh, we will take the uh, this one. I mean, many questions are there that has already been answered. Why our? Uh, I suggest that uh, surely we cannot take uh, many more questions. Maybe a last question. Yeah, I, yeah. I suggest that uh, all the participants can perhaps uh, send their questions by mail. We can note them, and yes. then we can perhaps request panelists to also respond, and then we'll be. Uh, we could perhaps uh, reply back to the participants. I think that's the only way we, because we are now quarter to five now. And uh, I think we have uh, all others have uh, some more commitments on that. So I think last question, perhaps. Uh, uh, this is uh, Dr. A.K. Arya. Uh, he's asking about, uh, he's there. I'm unmuting. Uh, Dr. Arya, you can unmute yourself. He's asking uh, about. Uh, why HR professionals being human engineers, they're not playing the role uh, when this is a most uh, crucial time period now. Uh, yeah, Dr. Arjia, just a very short question, please. Yeah, uh, my question is already clear. See, HR uh, professional being expert in human behavior, they should be playing a uh, leading role in international business through negotiation, through taking the leadership role and all that. I don't see that coming not only in India, but uh, all over the world. What is the reason? Well, as far as I, I think uh, for any international opportunity, companies uh, uh, do take uh, HR into consideration because uh, if it is a kind of a acquisition merger uh, kind of a scenario, uh, the HR perhaps is the most important aspect that need to be taken care of that. If it is again a, a acquisition and merger, then of the legal aspects have to be really seen that. So I think it's from the from the point of view of what opportunity is there that you the companies really make up their uh, their their teams. But to my mind, I think uh, whenever is required, uh, HR does play a role in terms of uh, uh, making an analysis as to uh, what are the best practices here, how we can really. Uh, uh, synergize our operations on that. Um, um, anything that Bob you want to add on? Can you unmute uh, Bob? Unmute. Please unmute Bob, sir. I've just done it. I think it's a brilliant question. Um, um, the, the, 
and and you know if you look around the world as uh, as as you know both um Dabika, rf and i do a lot um in, a, in our world federation sort of role it's it's a patchy picture um i think the one of the fundamental issues is um hr is on a journey uh in terms of professionalization and in some parts of the world it's highly professional it's been well developed it has a seat at the table and it is seen to actively and visibly contribute uh, to building value in, in organizations. In other parts of the world, it's further back. Um, there's a maturity curve involved of, of how the profession has been developed over the years. Um, an awful lot also depends on the industry structures. It depends upon actually, in some cases, governmental structures um, mm -hmm. as, as to whether or not um, professions are recognized in, in the same sort of way. I mean, you know, if you think about it, um, accountancy professions, legal professions, medical professions, etc., they've been around for an awful long time. HR is relatively, even now, is relatively young. Uh, the first signs of uh, formal human resources or welfare were around about 1900, 1903. Um, CIPD, for example, was founded in um, 1913. So, um, you know, compared to other professions, <laughs> we're still relatively young. But I think part of the issue is that um, we don't spend enough time developing the professional competence of HR people uh, to the level where they can actually engage and discuss and be part of the business. You know, a lot of people I speak to say, well, I ended up in HR, which drives me mad, by the way. It's a choice. We should choose to be in HR because it's a great profession. Um, but they say, I ended up in HR because I don't like numbers or um, uh, I don't like analytics or whatever. And yet the whole profession is now founded upon our understanding of the business, the can we not just speak the language, do we really understand how business operates? Um, you know, one of the questions I often ask to some of my, when I, when, I, when I teach occasionally, is can people even define net cash flow in a business? Can they define the operating model and the margins it's working on? And the majority of them can't. Now that means we're, we're actually not educating or professionalizing rapidly enough. So I think from my perspective, it's a, it's a journey. We're on a maturity curve. And I think it's a, a matter of HR people really equipping themselves with business skills, which allow them to, to actually operate at that sort of level. Um, and, you know, this is happening in some parts of the world. There are fantastic examples of this. Um, and we look at our national institutes and I know NIPM is doing a lot of work in this area. I certainly know that in um, uh, CIPM uh, and, uh, and of course in Mauritius, they're doing a lot of work on professionalization. But we as a global profession need to come together more on that and start looking at whether we have international standards and international levels of professionalism and place the profession in the same level as we, you know, when we look at a, a finance professional, for example. Um, interestingly, one final point in Africa, in uh, Malawi, which is only a small country, as we know, with a small number of personnel people, they now have a mandatory government law that in order to practice the HR profession, you have to be professionally certificated. That's amazing um, that that's happening. And that's the sort of uh, example we ought to be following, I think, for the profession globally. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, there is a uh, definitely initiative uh, of a certification that's becoming very popular in India as well now to certify HR professional for very predetermined levels of their work. Uh, and Mr. Arya, let me also say there are um, several uh, CEOs who have really gone through the HR route who are driving some international businesses. So we have good examples, but as Bob said, yes, um, I think we have to go a long way to really be maturing and graduating as the main driver of the 
uh, you know, business. And then perhaps we'll have the right place in that. Sir, Mr. Thank Hamika, you very much. Mr. Dhamika has a point. Uh, to turn. Yeah, Dhamika. Please unmute uh, Mr. Dhamika. See, by and large, I go with uh, what Bob has to, uh, to say. Now, it's, it's kind of a well-rounded uh, answer, but a uh, few things that I can add, because I, as a CEO of an organization, you know, uh, from from the you know uh, the the uh, first hand, what I can say is, people uh, the uh, leaders, the organization leaders expect uh, uh, from HR the bottom line, how how the, how HR how people managers contribute to the bottom line. Are they a cost center or a profit center? How can how do they contribute to the bottom line? And that is one of the uh, age old questions that we've been asking. Right, and also the other thing is about uh, Bob very correctly said analytics and uh, uh, some recent introduction to HR, but then it has gone a long way with the support of AI and all that, and that is how 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 the uh, HR analytics can help people. You know, m more often than not, because I've been a dual professional engineering and an HR as well. Uh, as well. Uh, more often than not, uh, our HR people or the people managers are not very savvy with their numbers. So this is, this is one of the big deterrents uh, for the industry, for the profession. And also I must quote uh, Dr. Rao again. He is the one who has uh, you know, contributed a lot in uh, a lot in producing the HR scorecard, I think well ahead of uh, 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 Deval Rich. Uh, Dr. Rao has produced a good HR scorecard and I learned from him also. And uh, the other fa the factor which he has also been discussing with me in IPM and Dr. Rao has been discussing with me like CIPD. I think CIPD is probably the only one. I, I mean, uh, the RE or SHRM, I, I wonder whether Sherm's having a particular set, uh, a professional course in professional certification in HR and CIPM. One of the things that we had CIPMs have been having for a long, long time in the history is that our study course and our business uh, school as uh, good as, uh, you know, Bob mentioned the CIPD business school. So that through the business school that you're contributing to the profession and help the profession to get the proper certification levels, uh, whether it is uh, uh, NVQ or uh, the university postgraduate level. So that then again, the chartered qualification. So we've been talking about Dr. Rao and then and, uh, Mr. Kulkarni. Uh, that is one of the things that, you know, you, your profession can get catapulted into the center stage and also as a, uh, to the board position that chart uh, table. So that is the, my bit that I wanted to contribute uh, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. I think uh, we'd like to close uh, this uh, discussion now. I, I must thank my panelists for wonderful inputs. Uh, and, and we'd like to continue uh, having your inputs uh, whenever there are some questions, some uh, inputs required from there. Um, I'd also like to propose that uh, all the participating countries, I think uh, I'm proposing some, some kind of a joint study in times of... Uh, what would be in this region our response uh, post COVID and how do we prepare ourselves to be more competitive in business and particularly how we can upgrade our HR profession, professionals to be able to be more productive and perhaps uh, graduate as, as business leaders, not just HR professionals. So I think we'll circulate maybe uh, some, uh, some ideas on that and, and look forward to your your participation. And I'd like to um, give back to Dr. Sahu and uh, Mr. Kulkarni uh, with my thanks to all the panelists and all the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It's time for uh, expressing the, our gratitude. Uh, we are grateful to this distinguished uh, panelists and the excellent uh, moderator, Dr. Valian Saab, all our panelists, uh, Mr. Bob, Mr. Damika, Mr. Afib, Mr. Uh, uh, Salaru and uh, our own uh, Mr. Vishwas Kulkarni Saab. We are uh, really grateful to Kulkarni Saab. He has been guiding us. Just coming, sir. So, right. uh, we, you have given time, all panelists, for the benefit of the HR professionals. We are grateful. We are grateful to National Council members and uh, 
all the uh, uh, participants who have really participated till the end, they, have, uh, they are with us. Thank you all. We look forward for another, another event with all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Namaste to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. T.V. Rao Ji. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Vishwash. Thanks, uh, Vishwash, Dr. Shahu, and uh, Ashok. Thanks a lot. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very good moderation. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.